so I'm going to talk about regression models and uh, the basic uh, problem that uh, most people don't know how to do regression analysis correctly. Furthermore, the textbooks do not teach it in the right way, so it is not really their fault. Uh, okay, so let me start by saying that uh, one of the basic ideas that is required for a correct analysis of a regression model is that the assumptions are valid. We might call this the axiom of correct specification. In fact, we could call this, this is going to be my topic in the sense of, for this lecture, that a regression model is valid only if all of the assumptions of the regression model are satisfied. Now, everybody who takes a regression course studies the assumptions of the regression model. Magar, nobody knows why these are studied because after you study them, then there is not much mention that is made of them. So, one of the key assumptions is that you have the right model. You have all of the right regressors. You have um, the right functional form. All of the regressors are exogenous. The model remains the same in every period. It doesn't change from time to time. The parameters don't change. So there are a huge number of assumptions. A small number of these assumptions are sometimes tested. But most often, people don't actually even test those assumptions. And they assume that the regression, so for example, we have a paper that has been submitted to our uh, uh, PDR. In the paper, um, the author says that he wants to uh, study the relationship between FDI and economic growth. So he runs a model in which economic growth is on the left hand side and FDI is one of the variables on the right hand side. And then he says literacy also matters, so he puts in another variable which is called literacy. And then he also takes uh, interaction terms, so he takes literacy and multiplies it by FDI. And then he runs the regression, he gets a high R squared and uh, the coefficients are significant. So he concludes that uh, this is a good regression and then he looks at the coefficient on FDI. And he says, okay, so if I increase FDI by so, 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 some, so much, the impact on economic growth will be so much. Mm -hmm. Now, this is uh, what people are taught. We were having interviews for uh, lecturers recently. And nearly everybody responded to this question in the same way. So suppose I say, ask you that I want to determine the effect of health on economic growth. So what will you do? If you look at the uh, WDI, World Development Indicators data set, you will find variables related to health. So something will be, uh, there will be a variable on hospitals, 
there will be a variable on access to clean water supply, there will be a variable on um, number of doctors per population and a few other variables. So you take all of those variables and you put them on the right hand side and you take economic growth on the left hand side and then you run a regression and you are off, you have your thesis. So now the question is can both of these people be right? And the, pers the first person is telling us that here is the <coughs> equation which is uh, says that economic growth depends on foreign direct investment and on literacy and the other person is running the regression on uh, economic growth and on health and they are both uh, coming up with their conclusions. So what does the axiom of correct specification have to say about this? Can anybody answer this question? Can both of those authors be right? Yes? No? How many votes for yes? How many votes for no? Okay, so why, why cannot both people be right? Okay, all of these are good intuitive understandings, but there is, you see the axiom of correct specification says that your model is valid only if it is true. So can both of these be true models? It is impossible. The FDI model says that health does not matter because the health variables are not included. The health model says that FDI does not matter because FDI. So either the FDI model is true or the health model is true or both are false but it is impossible that both can be right. It is impossible. There is only one true model for economic growth and if you have it then your interpretation is valid. If you don't have it then your interpretation is wrong. There is only one true model. This is the very serious problem which textbook does not mention. Even though it is written there, yani it is written uh, in a, it is, wh what is written implies what I am saying but this point is never made because if you made this point you would stop doing econometrics. Because if you have 10 variables only, then if you look at all possible combinations of regressors, that is 2 raised to the power of 10. That is more than a million. So you have more than a million possible regression models, only one of which is correct. So how much, what is the chance of you are getting the correct model? But if you don't get the correct model, and this is assuming all models are linear. Now if you have log forms and uh, non-linearities and other functional forms then your chances are like uh, this is an ocean and your chances are finding is like chances of finding a, 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 a drop of water in, inside the ocean or a speck of dirt inside the desert. So you see you cannot run a regression model like this, which everybody does. Yani, suppose I want to find the effect of health. Well, this is how the people do it. I mean, I, I'm not taking this example out of my mind. I, this is one of the theses that was written, that was presented at, uh, at our interviews that 
somebody had written a thesis on health and this is what they had done. Now, the question is, suppose that, okay, you are uh, running this model. Our own um, yani, students and faculty have written papers like this. We have published papers like this in the PDR. Now, suppose you run this model that I have um, GDP on a lot of health variables. Then, if this model is right, then there are 1,000 papers which people have written on uh, GDP growth. 1,000 people, uh, I mean, literally, this is true, more than 1,000. And none of them has included health variables, so all of those papers are wrong. If my paper is right, then all of those papers are wrong because they have ignored the health variable. If those papers are right, then my paper is wrong. So, there is a very serious problem which is simply not mentioned in uh, textbooks. So, the question is, what can be done about this? Um, there is an approach which is called the encompassing methodology, which is due to Henry, David Henry. Uh, and I will talk a little bit about this. But uh, I will also show you some examples to explain why uh, this is such a serious problem that people don't understand. All right, so this uh, is a World Bank data set. I am going to take this uh, household consumption series. This is the Algerian household consumption series. Oops. This is the Australian GDP series. Okay, so now Algeria is in Africa, Australia is somewhere else. So if I run a regression on these series, uh, there should be no relationship, right? I asked this question of one of the people who were in the econometrics interview. That I take two variables, they have no relation. I take um, Nigerian GDP and I take... Um, uh, Bolivia's uh, consumption or Nepal's GDP and uh, Chile's consumption. So, will there be any relationship? So, obviously not. These two variables are unrelated. Our regression theory says that if you have two variables which are not related, then there will be no relation. Now, they have a, uh, we can run regressions here. Now, I am going to run a regression. Y range. X range, Y range is now A5 to A54, that's Algerian consumption, and then uh, B5 to B54, that's uh, Australian GDP. Uh, I think we are all right now. Output range. Yeah, 
यहाँ पे ले आते हैं ओके okay. इट इज नाउ दी आर स्क्वेड इज सेवेंटी वन परसेंट you see now the x variable coefficient is 0.047 so the consumption in uh, was it uh, algeria is about 5% of the gdp in australia the significant the coefficient is highly significant t statistic is 10.9 standard error is 0.004 so if you look at plus or minus two standard errors around this coefficient zero is very far away so now we conclude that actually people think that the consumption in algeria is determined by the uh, gdp of algeria but it is not true what is um, actually true is that however much uh, gdp occurs in australia 5% of that is consumed by the people in uh, uh, in algeria so r squared is good strong 70% is pretty good and um, so and you can do this on any two countries so first so what does the axiom of correct specification have to say about this yes what is the problem why can't we How is that? Both variables are influenced by other variables, which is no theoretical background. Theoretical background. You see, what happens is that uh, this is a good uh, question, but it is fairly deep. Uh, theoretical background is an important missing element, which is not taught in your uh, textbooks. Suppose I go to this health person and say, "Okay, okay." you are saying that the health variables are causing gdp how does it happen this is the real issue which is mentioned nowhere in the textbook but it is one of the most fundamental issues in understanding regression analysis and that is why a crucial component of any good regression analysis must be an a uh, historical and qualitative analysis which nobody is doing except that i tell my students to do this uh because you have to establish the causal chain the causal chain does not establish by numbers you have to go and say okay when people are healthy then they work harder and so you have to look at missing hours of work and how they are related to health so you have to think about how the health variable affects similarly for fdi you can't just run a regression okay here's my regression r squared is high coefficient is significant therefore gdp affects right still i think the main point people are still not getting which is the axiom of correct specification which is the underlying everything this regression interpretation is true only if the regression is valid the regression is valid means that i have all of the right regressors and none of the wrong regressors now are there any missing regressors in this equation in the uh, algerian con uh, gnp algerian consumption on australian gdp are there any missing regressors yes so why how do you know ke hona nahi chahiye well you see uh if i say that health matter uh, why any yani australian gdp has an effect world trade is linked so you cannot exclude it like that can you let go there are good arguments and strong arguments and then there are weak and so you have to learn how to make strong arguments when you say that something is a mistake then you should be able to say something 
which will be convincing. Now, okay, now I have put the Australian consumption in here. Oh, that is not what I wanted actually. What I wanted was something else. Okay, now I'm going to put in the Algerian GDP. Look, the thing is that there is a very important fundamental missing variable from this regression. What is the missing variable in the regression of Algerian consumption on uh, an Australian GDP? Obviously, हाँ. Theory tells us that consumption function में the consumption is a function of the GDP of the nation. So once you have a most important missing variable, then all regressions are wrong, which in exclude the most important variable because you have a missing variable. सही है ना? If you have, this is called misspecification analysis. Everybody has studied this theory, but somehow this theory is never used. So the students are never taught. This is the very strange thing about the econometrics textbook. They tell you the right things in bits and pieces, but when it comes to the application, everything is forgotten. And that's why our students uh, produce these hopeless theses and they answer these questions in a hopeless way which is completely wrong and they have no idea even though these things are there. So, if you have the missing variable then misspecification analysis tells you that because of the missing variable the equation is misspecified. Now, there is a practical aspect to this also in the sense that if you have the if, if the missing variables are minor, they have small effect, then uh, excluding them only has a small effect on the regression. But if you have major missing variables, then everything is completely wrong. So here we have a major missing variable because the main determinant of GDP has not been mentioned. Now according to Keynesian theories, the GDP growth is determined primarily by the investment. The investment in that country is the exogenous variable and the sentiments of the investors, they drive the economy. If the investments are confident and bullish and they are putting a lot of money, then that will cause growth. If the investors are not investing, if they are, then there will be no growth. Now, what do you think of the health and the FDI regressions, which were actual papers which were one was a thesis that was passed and approved and, and uh, somebody got their MPhil. The other was a paper that was submitted to PDR and the author appealed to me that my perfectly good paper has been rejected by PDR. Please uh, help me and uh, get this published. So what do you think is the problem with these two papers, uh, the health and the FDI? Yes, please. What is the specification error? Which is the missing variable? GDP is what's being uh, is the dependent variable. Huh? Which other variable? What is the primary determinant of GDP growth? investment according to Keynesian theory. If investment is not present in the equation, then the equation is majorly misspecified. Now let me show you what happens if I run the regression Okay, so that's a5 to A54 hmm. 
चाहे इसको पहले कैंसिल कर दें असल में वो एक्सेल में द रिक्सेस हैव टू बी राइट नेक्स्ट टू ईच अदर इट कैन नॉट हैंडल सो आई व्हाट आई वांट टू डू इज आई वांट टू रन फर्स्ट वी रन अल्जेरियन कंसम्पशन एंड ऑस्ट्रेलियन जीडीपी एंड नाउ आई वांट टू रन ओ अच्छा ठीक है आई नीड टू पुट दैट इन हियर आई वांट टू रन इट ऑन विद द मिसिंग वेरिएबल so i want to put australian gdp and nigerian gdp algerian Okay, so now I have Algerian consumption and then Australian and Algerian GDP, and now I'm going to run the regression. Okay. so i made the regresses from b5 to c54 which is the next two columns what that means is that i've got um, uh australian consumption ne algerian consumption on both australian and on uh, algerian so i'm going to put this L. क्या हो गया है एक्स रेंज में प्रॉब्लम है ओ अच्छा डबल डॉलर आ गया यहाँ पे सही है ओके सो नाउ द आर स्क्वेड इज गॉन अप टू एटी एट परसेंट now it's very interesting the first x variable this is the uh this is australia g n p and this is uh, algeria g n p so now we run um algerian consumption and we find that uh Algerian GNP is very powerful, important, and there is a fifty percent marginal propensity to consume. But Australian GNP is not irrelevant as it should have been. It frequently is in these equations, but actually Australia is very strong, significant, and it has a negative effect, negative two percent, and this is uh, standard error is very low, zero point zero zero eight. t statistic is minus 2.5 which means that it's a you see if you look at the p value it's 0.15 which means that it's significant at not quite 1% level but 1.5% which is significant at 5% for example so australian gnp is still significant again this is most likely just a wrong uh result and the wrong result is because uh we have excluded an important variable now you have to understand you have to use your brains uh you have to understand why this is happening intuitively without any formulas why did we get a positive strong coefficient when we ran australian gnp directly and a negative one when we put in the right way but here this is the australian gnp
Now the Australian GNP, if we just run Australian GNP, then the effect is 5%. Uh, 5%, so a positive coefficient, and the effect is that the if Australian GNP increases, uh, Algerian consumption will increase by 5%. Now the second regression is saying that if Australian GNP increases, the Algerian consumption will go down by 2%. So which of these is right? Now, you have to understand, yes, okay. So, first, I mean, uh, the one question is that why we have positive coefficient here, that is something you can answer. Why we have negative over there, that's not so easy. But the implication of this, notice that, suppose that investment is the key determinant of the um, GDP growth and it is not present in your FDI equation, which it is not, then can we even say that the sign is right for the FDI? After you have omitted the most important variable, then nothing can be said. Whether it is positive contribution or negative contribution or no contribution, this is what the axiom of correct specification says that unless you have the right equation, all your interpretation is wrong. So if you are missing a primary variable, then your regression is wrong. So uh, this paper is completely wrong. Another uh, yani, nearly every paper that we see makes this type of mistakes. Nearly every paper that we submit makes this kind of mistake that the primary variables that are important are missing. Now, one very important thing that you can understand here is why is Australian GNP coming out positive and significant in this equation? Because what? Because what? Huh? Trade between, no, that's wrong. There is in fact very little trade between Australia and Algeria. Very, very little. What? What is the main determinant of Algerian GNP, Algerian consumption according to economic theory? Excuse me? Main determinant of Algerian consumption? Income, exactly. Algerian income. Excuse me? No, foreign aid is not the main determinant of consumption. Algerian GDP, if you look at your microeconomic theory, consumption is a function of income. That is the primary, main, most important determinant. So, when that variable is taken out, then everything else acts as a proxy for this variable. Because that is the missing variable, that's the main determinant. So what do you think is the relationship between Australian GNP and Algerian GNP? Both are increasing, both are time. Both are increasing functions. Both will be positive. Basically, GDP is growing in all the countries. So all of them will have positive correlation. So this Australian GNP is acting as a proxy for the missing variable which is Algerian GNP. Since this variable is strongly positively correlated, we can check it actually easily. Uh, check it equals correl of uh, B5 to B55 C5 
95% correlation between Australian GDP and Algerian GDP. And this will always be the case for any two GNP series because they are all strongly increasing. So, if you have a missing variable and that missing variable is the primary variable, so you have to distinguish if you are going to do real regression analysis, then you have to, there is a, a very important difference between big primary variables which are strongly determining and small variables which have minor effects. Uh, again, this is something which people don't understand. If I want to determine the effect of health on uh, GDP, and health is a minor way, say it has a 5% impact on GDP, then if I am running a regression on uh, 20, 25 points of data in Pakistan, for example, it is impossible to find this effect because there is too little data to pick up a small effect. It's just something which is intuitive. I mean, if you want to pick up a small effect, you have to have a lot of data. If you want to pick up a big effect, if you want to ask what is the effect of Pakistan GNP on Pakistan consumption, you can do it with 20-25 points. But if you want to find out the effect of doctors on GNP, you cannot do it. It's, there's not enough data or with 20-25 points annual data. You might be able to do it in some other way. You can do it by, for example, assessing what is the effect of the labor force hours on GDP. Now, labor force hours will be a major determinant because production function is F of KL. So now if you find out the effect of labor force hours on GDP, then you ask how much does the medical factor affect on the labor force hours? Again, this can be, this is a, a strong effect. So you can trace it with small amount of data. Then you will be able to find out. But if you directly affect uh, GDP on, um, yani if you look, so, so by breaking it up into the causal chain, this is very important, which nobody knows how to do. And it is not taught in the textbooks. If you want to affect, and this is actually related to Maria's question that what is the real effect and you have to go behind you can just you cannot just look at the numbers you have to look at the real world causal sequence what is the mechanism by which health factors will affect GNP and you have to trace the causal chain okay one important effect of health will be that people will not be able to go into work so you can get data on sick leaves in government organization, how many times people are applying for sick? You can get data on uh, in hospitals. You can take a survey and find out how many people who are in the hospital uh, they are uh, working and they are off from their jobs. So there are various ways you can get an estimate of how health affects hours worked, and that should be relatively easy, clean. Uh, relationship with short causal chain, then you can do estimation and then you can go on to the other step which would be how much hours affected affect GNP and then you can get a small and even if the health hours take like 5% or 10% effect on labor hours, once you have an uh, impact of labor hours on GDP, then you can use that to get your estimate. But you cannot go directly because the intermediate variable is missing. So one of the um, theses that was proposals that were submitted was that we want to assess the effect of migration from uh, Azad Kashmir on the crop yields. Now, this is the kind of nonsensical idea that students are coming up with for their thesis proposals that I take two variables, nobody has ever done this before, so now this is a thesis topic. What nonsense? This is not how it is done. Yani, 
if you as I said if you have only 10 variables you have 1 million regressions so 1 million students can write theses because there will be 1 million regressions which nobody has done before there has to be some sense in that regression now if um, migration has what is the crop yields crop yields depend on you know how much seed you put in how whether you run the tractor whether you put in fertilizer weather these are your primary variables if you take out all of those variables and you run a regression you might you will get something because what will happen is that when you take out the significant variables then the insignificant variables take the place of those significant variables and the and the coefficients this is exactly what you are taught in mathematics but nobody explains the meaning you are taught uh, you are, if you if you take a good course in econometrics they go through the formulas for the bias when you have a misspecification if you take out one of the variables you can calculate what the bias will be if you put in the wrong variable it's a very complicated for, formula and meaningless but basically if you interpret the mathematics it's saying that this variable is trying to fill the place of the variable which is missing and so the coefficient will be according to how it relates to the missing variable here we have a very simple situation uh, there is only one missing variable uh, let's say that is the Algerian GNP so everything will depend the coefficient will depend on how the variable correlates with this missing variable but now um, after you put in the missing variable <coughs> then there are still other determinants yani we've got 90% of the way but now there is 10% left and there will be other variables which will be important now uh, maybe uh, now why this is coming out negative well probably because after you account for the uh, after you account for uh, Algerian GNP then uh, then uh, there will be other variables. maybe it's exports of Australia again you see in order to find out we have to study very carefully what is actually going on this is again real world situation for example suppose that uh, Australia and uh, Algeria both produce oil suppose I'm not sure uh, and so when the Australian GNP is strong they are uh, exporting more oil and this cuts into the oil exports of oil Algeria so then that would explain the negative correlation but that doesn't mean that this is a good regression then we would need to put in that causal chain in order to understand what is going on so you have to understand the real world in order to understand how to do regression analysis correctly and this is unfortunately never explained in uh, courses So, the axiom of correct specification is a very dangerous axiom. It says that you can interpret the equation validly only if you have the right equation. The chances of your having a right equation are one in a million. So, you are dead from the start. There is no chance that you have and that is why uh, your econometrics textbooks don't even mention this problem because this problem is so great that we can simply dump all of the articles that we see into the garbage without even looking at them because what are the chances that the author is runs a regression says okay this this and that and blah 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 but everything depends on 
the assumption that he has got the right model and the chances of getting the right model are just not, uh, not much more than zero. So what can you do to avoid this? Well, this is what the Henry methodology does. What uh, people normally do is that they start by So, uh, normally what we do when we run regression analysis is we start by uh, taking some simple model and then we test this model and with the test uh, work then we stop. That is, uh, I mean if you have a strong R squared and the coefficients are good then we say okay we have found the model. Now the thing is that as I have said Everybody can find a different model and, uh, and be everybody does. But not all of those variables, uh, only one of those regressions can be correct. So I have a paper in which there is health which is the explanation of GNP, another paper which is FDI and there are hundreds of papers. One of them is taking literacy, one of them is taking religious background as the source of the GNP growth. So everybody can write a different paper, but only one of this can possibly be correct and most likely all of them are wrong. And in fact, if we take the simple Keynesian theory that investment is the primary determinant of GNP, then any paper in which investment is not used as a variable is automatically wrong. You can throw it in the garbage and that means nearly everything that people are doing uh, with GNP growth and nearly everybody, I mean, a huge number of theses are written on what explains GNP growth because today GNP growth is God. Uh, this is the thing that everybody is pursuing even though it is very harmful actually to go for GNP growth. But So here is a FDI growth paper. Then there is another paper on intellectual property rights and growth. And again, this paper takes these variables, very well written paper, here is GDP, here is IPR, uh, International Property Rights Index, FDI, EFW, the Freedom Index, Trade, GDP Ratio, Population Growth, Secondary Years of Education and Gross Domestic Investment. Now here he has put in the investment variable, so at least the major, uh, the one criticism that the major variable has not been included is not applicable to this equation and here is the analysis GDP equals 121 times IPR plus 0 0.06 times FDI plus 33 times economic freedom, one, 0 0.01 times trade uh, ratio, 
131.9 times population growth and so on. So, then he says, the analysis clearly shows that the enforcement of IPR by one unit would significantly cause to increase GDP by 121 units. This is the coefficient is 121. So it means that in Pakistan we should start enforcing intellectual property rights. Because now, can we rely on this regression? Can we any... You see, this is the thing that uh, you are uh, being treated like children. You are being told that these are games you are playing. But actually, this is not true. Now you are in the top 1% of Pakistan. Tomorrow you are going to be heading the analysis and policy think tanks and you are going to be in the ministries and you are going to be... And, and if you are going to... Actually, just recently, uh, the commerce minister was called to question for... Uh, uh, why is Pakistan export performance not uh, very good? So he did exactly this. He said, okay, let's look at it. He assigned the task to one of his staff and they um, ran a regression of export growth on four or five variables. And they said, look, the problem is that uh, we have too many tariffs and we have this and that. And uh, by running a regression like this, he came to a conclusion. Now, the question that I am asking you is, is this reliable? Should we, I and mean, once I have this regression, can I go out and, and say, okay, we should, we have uh, so many, any CDs that are being pirated and nearly everybody, every one of you is uh, running uh, Word and uh, Excel on, without unlicensed copies, so, before you go out, please pay your fees for the $700 that requires to buy the Microsoft Word and Microsoft Excel. So that will increase the GDP of Pakistan? What do you think? So now, are we any jokers that we should go and run these regressions and make these policy recommendations like everybody is doing and people are running these regressions and in the health uh, equation the girl who wrote the thesis said that okay this is what it is uh, GDP will increase by 10% if we increase health so we should put so much money into doctors and hospitals and so on is this a reliable recommendation, is this valid? Can we trust this result? Yes, What's, what do you think? Can we trust this result? This guy has done a lot, this is much more sophisticated than others, he has done the integration analysis and the co-integration analysis and uh, Johansson test, yes? But this is my point of view. Yes, Khalid. I think so. It depends upon uh, how you are trying to interpret this. For me, this may be the case because if you are getting a licensed copy of all the CDs, that means that that economic activity would be rewarded. For example, if we are buying a CD which is worth 5 rupees or 50 rupees, and vice versa, we are getting a licensed copy whereby we have to pay, let's say, 5,000, that might add up in a Okay, Khalid, what you are saying is that uh, we can think about the problem whether uh, uh, intellectual properties cause uh, an increase in GDP or not and we can apply our brains and I agree with that fully but the question I am asking is is this regression result reliable? Uh, okay, let me ask a second question. Suppose that I gave you an assignment to produce something which is almost 
exactly parallel to this regression. Yani something which is equally, yani this uses the same methodology, the same tactics, the same uh, level of rigor. Could you get another equation in which this number would be minus 100, minus 100? Would it be possible? Instead of plus 100, can you get minus 100 here? Yes? Yes? Kya wa? नहीं वो तो है इसमें इन्वेस्टमेंट है इसमें GDI ग्रोस डोमेस्टिक इन्वेस्टमेंट हाउ इज दैट Currently, we have this linear model. Suppose I made this into a log linear model. Suppose I put in quadratic terms. I take exactly these things, but I suppose I put in interaction terms. Suppose I put in um, uh, some other variables for the same variable, like economic freedom. All right. So suppose instead of taking the economic freedom index, suppose I I look at the number of elections which are being held, uh, the number of transitions. There are many other ways that uh, people have thought. Suppose that in the trade liberalization, there are at least 10 different measures which people have devised for uh, free trade indexes. Uh, uh, one depends on the difference between the black market rate and the uh, uh, and the uh, official exchange rate, uh, uh, hundreds, yeah, I mean. so each of these variables, I can find alternates. What would you think would happen to this coefficient? This will remain the same at 120 as I change these variables or will it change? How much will it change? I mean, this is the question that, see what I am trying to show you is that this is not an issue of point of view. This is the issue of reality. If I give this second, if I give this same exercise to another person to do and he picks up a different series and he picks up a different data set, he will get a completely different result. This result is completely unreliable. If this result is completely unreliable, we cannot go around and start making policy recommendations on this. And not only is this folly, but this is completely, I and mean, this is what students are being taught to do. And um, if you, once you understand what is going on, you can get the result that you want. Now, um, for example, uh, one of my students, uh, Zahid Asghari, was, uh, I asked him to do uh, the Granger causality test. So, uh, we experimented with a little bit of things that, okay, the data set is going on from 1960 to 2015 or 2010, so that's about 50 years of data. If you take out the last five years or take out the first five years, you get completely different results. If you um, change the specification, yes, from log log to log linear or, or direct direct, everything gives a different result. And ultimately if you learn about what's happening then you can get all four results. X causes Y, Y causes X, bidirectional causality and uh, no causality. And this is not just, uh, yani, he showed this but actually if you go in the literature and look at papers, you can find all four results for any one country. In fact, I have in one of my papers, I have uh, collected there, I think there are 15, 16 papers written on uh, 
think it's export-led growth. And uh, some people say, yes, exports cause growth. Some people say, uh, no, growths cause exports. Some people say that there is bidirectional causality, and some people say there is no relation. And you can find published papers on all four. So if there is some something valid in this methodology, then it should be reflected in the stability of the results. So it's not a question of point of view, it's a question of what is out there. So, so what can we do about this? Well, this is what the... <coughs> see, so I say that in, in my point of view, the, there was a paper that was written in, uh, this is the paper, Econometric Modeling of Aggregate Time Series Relations Between Consumers' Expenditure and Income in United Kingdom. This is simply a model of the consumption function. Uh, consumption equals alpha plus beta y. This is the most basic relationship, very strongly theoretically supported that yes, your consumption should be some proportion of your income. And uh, in this paper, he formulates the methodology, uh, the Henry methodology as it is called. This is the beginning, the first paper. And uh, my view is that if you don't understand this paper, you know nothing about econometrics. And if you understand this paper, then you have the beginnings of an understanding of, of econometrics. So, this paper starts by saying that uh, the Keynesian consumption function is one of the most thoroughly researched topics. But there is no consensus. <coughs> Everybody who estimates the consumption function comes to a different result. And these different results are very important because uh, these uh, was, they uh, determine the investment multiplier, the marginal propensity to consume, they determine the short run uh, and the long run impacts of uh, government policy everything depends on the consumption function because you know in Keynesian economics the consumption function plays a major role if you have unemployment and the government wants to eliminate it then they have to stimulate the aggregate demand what is the aggregate demand? aggregate demand is the consumption function how much do the people want to consume? this is their, their demand if the demand is too low then there will be unemployment if the demand is too high, then there will be inflation. So it's important for you to have a good idea of what the consumption function is. If you don't have it, then you will make policy mistakes because the government is always trying to set the policy. This is the Keynesian theory. The government should try to find the level of expenditure at which the full employment level will be reached. If they put in too much money, money, money supply is one way to do this, there are two ways, monetary policy and fiscal policy. If you choose the monetary policy to be too high, then you will, if you overshoot the target, you will get inflation. If you undershoot, you will get unemployment. Both of these are policy mistakes. So you have to have a good idea of what the consumption function is. But there is no, uh, but if you look at the consumption functions which have been estimated in literature, he cites many of them, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different studies. All of them have different estimates. If you use one study, you will come to one number. If you use the second study, you will come to other number. There is no, no convergence and very big differences, not small differences. So, what is the problem? Why? So, first of all, why is there, why does everybody get a different result? So, what Henry says is that this is because we are using the wrong methodology. 
the most important thing for a methodology is that it should be cumulative. Cumulative means that knowledge should build. If the second person, if one person puts down a brick, then the second person should build on top of that or besides that so that the if everybody starts putting a brick in different places we will get a cluster of different bricks and there will be no uh, coherence so what this means is that when there is a collection of models on the ground so person X has done one study person Y has done uh, another study like we have here, Byron has done one study, Deaton has done another study, Henry has done another study, Bispham, Shepherd, Wall, Townsend, Bean, all of these people have done studies. Now, I can add an eighth study, and this is how people are working, that everybody has done growth, and now I'm going to add another paper on growth. People have thought about the effect of health, and on, but nobody has thought about the effect of haircuts. So now I'm going to go to the barber and get the haircut variable and I'm going to run a regression of number of haircuts. It will be very strong and positive actually because as the population increases the number of haircuts will increase and haircuts and GDP will be very strongly correlated. So we will have a new theory of the GDP. If everybody gets more haircuts we will get more GDP. So uh, then we will make policy recommendation that the government should go and increase the number of barber shops. This is actually what is going on. I'm not. This is unfortunately not not a joke. This is this is what's going on today in policy making. So, <coughs> what is the solution? Well, one of the keys to Henry is that when I put on a model. I must also say that my model is better than anything that is currently in the field. So I must test my model against all existing models and prove that my model is better than every other model. Once we do this, this is the key, this is the key idea of encompassing. So this is why when you do a regression model, you have to do a literature survey. Now, I am writing a paper on consumption function, suppose, or on GDP growth, or on any other thing. I have to look at all existing work. I have to say that, in fact, my student, uh, Rahman, he did his study on determinants of inflation. So I said, okay, find all of the papers that have been written on inflation in Pakistan not that many, about 10, 12, many of them coming from Bide also. Okay, so one person has done uh, inflation. So uh, we take all of those 12 regression models. Now, our goal is to produce an inflation model which is superior to all of those 12. So now when I produce this model, I will have the best regression model for Pakistan among all existing models. So, this is an easier problem than the problem of finding the one true regression model among the million. That cannot be solved, but at least I can solve this problem that I can beat everybody else. Now, that doesn't mean that my model is true. The next student to come along will find a model that will beat my model. But at least we will be making progress my model is better than all others and his model is better than mine. So there is some <coughs> continuity, there is some progress. So that is the key idea of the Henry methodology. So now, then there are uh, methods of model comparison. So this is becomes now key. Given two models, how do we compare them? <clears throat> how do I show that my model, just, just look at two models for the moment because, so I have a model which is the H model and uh, another person has a model which is called the W model. 
So now I must show that the H model is better than the W model if I'm going to implement this methodology. So how can you do that? Well, there are two methods. Uh, the one that is used by Henry is the uh, method for nested model testing. So in the nested model, what we do is we make a big model which includes both of the other models as a special case. <coughs> so consider for example the health model and the FDI model. Both are explanations for economic growth. One guy is saying that the economic growth is a function of FDI and literacy and the cross product and uh, the IPR model is saying putting in some other variables let's say just IPR and investment just for simply simplicity or let's put in the third variable also. So there is a model for growth. Growth is a function of uh, literacy and FDI. Another model for growth, growth is a function of health. Another model for growth, growth is a function of uh, intellectual property rights. So now I build a big model. In this model I must put in all key theoretical variables. If I don't, then uh, the model is dead from the start. So uh, in the model I must look at so one of the parts of, the, of your literature review is that you have to go to the theoretical papers, the ones which have not studied, uh, which have not necessarily run regressions and they, the theory, theory explains how GDP growth occurs. So one of the theories is Keynesian theory which says that the uh, GDP growth depends on the investment. But there are other theories of GDP growth as well. Uh, and you look through the literature, you, you actually comb the literature, search the literature, you are now looking at, at people who are doing literature, they have no idea what literature review is, why they are doing it. So what they do is they say, okay, here's this article and here's what he says and here's this article and here's what he says and they just make a list of unrelated pieces of uh, articles and they say this is the rasam by which we start the ceremonies and so we just cut and paste uh, descriptions of 20 different articles. This is called our, like, Tilawat al-Quran. We just, we have to do this and then we start the thesis. No relation between those 20 papers and anything that is written in the thesis. No, actually when you are doing your literature review, you are looking for very specific things. You are looking for regression equations because every regression equation on a similar topic you have to beat that in order to make your thesis. Also you are looking at theories to find out what are the variables which the theory says is important. Because if theory says that the variable is important you have to put it in regardless of whether or not anybody else has put it in. Like in this case the theory, Keynesian theory says investment is important. You have to put it in. Because if an important variable is missing your regression is wrong. So, now we make uh, the encompassing theory says you put in a, make a big regression model which includes everything as a special case. So, we, we put in a model for GDP growth in which we have investment and then we have the health variables and then we have the FDI and literacy and then we have the intellectual property rights. All of those variables are put in. Now, in this big model, every model is a special case in the sense that the FDI model says that the coefficients of IPR is zero, right? If the FDI model is right, then the, if that model is right, then he has excluded IPR. So what he is saying is that IPR doesn't matter. Otherwise, he should put it into his model. And similarly, the health variable is saying that IPR does not matter. And the IPR model is saying that health and FDI do not matter. So every model is a specification of zeros. A model says that these variables have zero coefficients. Now, all of you, if you have had your regression analysis course, you know how to test this null hypothesis. 
that some coefficients, some variables have zero coefficients. There is an F test for this and uh, all regression packages have an implementation. So you can test all of those three hypotheses. Each model is one hypothesis and sometimes it will happen <coughs> <coughs> that one of the models will be accepted and the other two will be rejected. This doesn't happen often but sometimes it can happen. Most often what will happen is that all three models will get rejected. So if all three models are rejected then all three models are wrong. Then what happens is that in your um, big model you look for a simple model which is not rejected by the data. Maybe the model is that works is the one which has investment and FDI but no IPR and no health. Then this is your model. So you find the best model which is uh, now when you when now when you present okay, here is my model I am saying that GDP growth is determined by investment and FDI but not by IPR and health. Now this is not just you took those two variables and you ran a regression and uh, you came up with the results but actually <coughs> you have looked at all of the million models because you put on all of the variables in there so all of the million variables are a special case of this model. So you have found a model which is equal in power to the big model, equal in power to all of the million variables, million regressions and it is not rejected by the data. This is the best you can do. This is the best you can do in the sense that you can never find the true model. Uh, this is one of the famous uh, uh, issues that have you heard of Karl Popper? Karl Popper is a philosopher of science and basically what happened in Western um, philosophy of science they had the idea <coughs> that science leads to true results and all true statements can be discovered by science. This was the idea and so they tried to develop a philosophy to prove this and they tried and they tried and they tried and actually they came up with a philosophy which is called logical positivism and if logical positivism is true then science is the only way to get to true knowledge everything else is just guesswork but and for a long time logical positivism was believed to be true because the westerns are very ideologically attached to the idea of science that science must be the only true producer so this philosophy proved that science was was the only sole route to truth so they believed in it even though the philosophy itself was not very well established. So ultimately in um, this philosophy was studied by philosophers and examined in detail and it was found to be false and ultimately rejected. And um, uh, there are many people who showed the many flaws in this philosophy. One of them was Karl Popper and Karl Popper showed that you can never prove anything by scientific method. You can never prove anything true, you can prove things to be false. So basically scientific methods relies on observations. So suppose that for one million years or one billion years every day we observe that there is a sunrise. So the scientific methodology says that there is a scientific law the scientific law says that every day sun will rise and we have one billion observations that this is a true. So uh, we can predict confidently that tomorrow also the sun will rise. But the problem is that this method of proof which is called induction is not valid because tomorrow the sun could go nova and there could be no sunrise or 
there can be some events like a meteorite comes in and destroys the planet Earth and there's just no more sunrise. So even though you have some event which has been going on regularly for one billion years without any <coughs> change, there is no guarantee that it will happen tomorrow. And that is why you can never prove a scientific law to be true, but you can prove it to be false. For example, uh, people in Europe uh, saw that all the swans are white. They didn't see anything else. So actually, you know, in the philosophy of science, this is given as an example that uh, there are two types of truths. There is mathematical truth, which you can prove, like the Pythagorean theorem, you can prove by logic. So it's automatically true. It doesn't depend on observations. You, can, you don't need to draw a triangle and check because you have proven it logically. And then there is empirical truth, which is called, uh, this is called analytic and synthetic. One, uh, one type is analytic and the other type is synthetic. So the synthetic truth is that uh, <coughs> you observe. So for example, there is a law that all swans are white because all swans in Europe are white. But when the Europeans went to Australia, they found that there is a black swan species. And this is a genuine swan in the sense that it can interbreed with the white swans of Europe. So they were said, so this is why there is a phrase called black swan. Black swan is, means something completely unexpected. <clears throat> so again, this is an illustration of the proper uh, idea that you can never, uh, you can disprove things, but you cannot prove things. So when I put up a theory which is better than all previous theories, then so far it is the best theory, but just like all scientific theories, tomorrow somebody may come and disprove it and there is no guarantee. You can never uh, make a truth guarantee. But you can only say that up to now, nobody has found uh, anything better than this. And this is the best you can do with a scientific theory. Now, um, so, the key idea of Henry methodology is that when I produce a model, it must encompass, encompass is standard word means covers or surrounds or, so I must encompass all existing theories. My theory must be better than everything that is currently on the ground. And I must be able to prove this. So one way to prove this is by the method that I have told you, which is called the nesting models. <coughs> So I find a big model which nests all the other models within it and then I test all the models and find a best model. So this best model that I find is automatically better than uh, all existing models. The other met method is uses the theory of non-nested uh, model testing. So here if I have a um, health model and an intellectual property right model, I don't need to made, make a big model which covers both of them. There are a number of different tests uh, which you can make um, and there are a number of different methodologies. All of these are quite complicated, much more complicated than the nested model uh, theory, but you can go to the books and find find the tests and run them. So you don't have to follow Henry methodology um, <clears throat> in, 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 in terms of uh, nested method testing. Uh, the, the key is that you have to test. And this you can do. So now what has been the experience? This Henry paper was written in 19... Uh, 70s. Interestingly enough, uh, the model that the DHSY model, Davidson, Henry, Serba, Yo, <coughs> they wrote this model in, when was it? It was, uh, I have the date. It was in the late 70s. 78. Hmm? 78, okay. Now, they actually completed this research in about 1975. 
and they found a model which was better than three existing models. The number of models that <coughs> were there were so many and in fact this is a useful technique that instead of covering all the models which would have taken a lot of time, uh, what they did was they took classes of models, groups of models. And okay, there are some people who say that these are the relevant variables. These 10 authors have studied social variables, for example, and they have put in uh, models related to freedom and health. And, and there are these people who say that exports, so then they have put in models related to uh, exports, imports, trade, huge number of trade statistics. And then there are people, I'm just giving you an example of how to do this kind of analysis for yourself. Because uh, if you go out and practice, you will find too many regression models to compete with. So what you do is you group them into uh, categories. And you say, okay, uh, one group deals with this kind of variable. And then from each category, you pick one. And this is what they did. Okay, they said that, okay, here is one type of model which deals with uh, transfer function. Here is one type of model which deals with stationary models. Here is one type of model which deals with uh, interest rate and others. So I pick one model from each category. So, <coughs> so they took, they took uh, one, one deals with seasonal change. So they took three models, H, B, and W. And they said, okay, now our goal is to build a model which will beat all of these three models. And they succeeded. Uh, they built the DHSY model, which was better than all of these three models. But it is not enough to be better than the best. You should also have, uh, the model should be good on its own. So when they did forecast testing of this model, they found that the model fails. The forecasts are very bad. Uh, they are rejected. You see, forecast, you have a model, your standard error of the model is, uh, let's say, uh, uh, 25. So that means that when you make a prediction, C equals alpha plus beta y, then the error should be within plus or minus 25. That's one standard error. Or within plus or minus 50. That's two standard errors. If the error is 100, that's four standard errors away, and that means your model has failed. So immediately, uh, and, and the key thing, very important, is that you have to make out-of-sample forecasts. Because if you, if, you, if you estimate the model on a data set, then all the data is automatically fitted. So now if you make within-sample forecasts, you say, okay, omit one point and forecast, but that, that data is already in your estimates. So it's not a serious forecast. A serious forecast is when, okay, I estimated this model up to 1975. I didn't have the data for 1976. Now the 1976 data comes in and it has GNP and C. And let's look at how well our model fits on this. There, you have no control. You have not looked at this data. So if your model works well on that, then you have some satisfaction that, okay, my model is well. Now the model failed. And not just uh, uh, failed uh, in a small way, it failed major way. So they couldn't publish the paper and they kept uh, trying to find a way <coughs> to, to improve the forecast performance and ultimately they found out that one of the things that was happening in that period <coughs> was financial liberalization. What that means is that it becomes easy to borrow money from the banks. And one of the ways that uh, the banks made it easy to borrow money was that they were <coughs> paying out. Uh, they said that, okay, if you have house and what was happening in London and also in other places, they were, uh, is that the value of the house has increased a lot. And the people had loans on the houses, but the loans were taken out on the original value, which was quite small. So the people had a lot of equity in the house. The house is worth 100,000, and they, they have a loan of 20,000 remaining on the house. So they have 80,000 pounds worth of equity in the house. So what the banks introduced at that time was 
housing equity withdrawals you can you can take a loan if you pledge you take uh, the house as a collateral so a lot of uh, money that was illiquid and unusable became liquid and usable because people could borrow money against the value of their homes and so when they put in a variable like this into their mo model then uh, the forecast became correct uh, and so then they published the paper and the paper is published like this and it has this but the thing is that this last method that they used was actually against the Henry methodology because the Henry methodology says you cannot add an ad hoc variable at the end to fix things the Henry methodology says that you should start with a big model which includes all models as special cases and you should come to the right model so now if we take all ad hoc variables which are missing from this there are too many now if we say that okay financial liberalization is the missing factor then there are at least 10 or 20 or 30 variables which relate to financial liberalization so if you actually and truly and sincerely followed the Henry methodology then you would have to start by putting on all of those variables and finding out the one configuration which is better than the rest and this they did not do so this is a this is a practical weakness of the Henry methodology that um, although it makes a very grand claim and it is very useful and among the existing methodologies it is the best available but still it is not the right answer not the correct methodology and in fact I am taking uh, faculty courses later on in which I will explain how first of all what the handy methodology is because most people don't even know that and then what are the defects and problems with the handy methodology and how, how we can fix them and how we can get to regressions which can be taken seriously not as a joke that okay we, I run newspapers and actually this is true you run newspapers on regression on, on GDP growth this will a number of newspapers being published you get a very strong correlation it is worldwide globally true and so the best way to improve our GDP growth is to just publish more newspapers. So, thank you.